See, in a forward wave theory, somehow you've got to get that particle from A to B. But in between A and B, the particle is a wave. So one has to quantize the wave in order to produce the particle when one looks at the screen. But with reverse waves, you have no such issue. The fact that the quantization is gone, by the way, will become even more evident when I talk about Feynman diagrams later. Um, there I'll obtain the correct result, including any multi-particle processes, without using any second quantization. There'll be no operators in this theory. Now, the double slit experiment provides some direct evidence of the reverse wave motion. The reverse wave theory is, is the only one that actually makes logical sense. So that in itself is evidence of the reverse motion. But there's some even more direct evidence, as shown on the next slide. This shows the double slit with lines drawn in representing uh, trajectories of particles traveling to the points of maximum intensity on the screen. So these lines represent paths where the largest number of particles would be traveling. But what if one moves the screen to a location like where the dashed line is? In that position, the maximal trajectories from one slit fall in between the trajectories from the other slit. So if the trajectories remained unchanged, the diffraction pattern would be washed out at that location. You'd see a more or less continuous distribution. But in fact, experimentally, we always see the same wave pattern at any screen location. So we're forced to conclude that the trajectories depend on the screen location. But the only way that can happen is if something's moving from the screen in the reverse direction to, to bring about this effect. And that something is these reverse waves. Now, in order to fill in the missing pieces here, uh, I, I must first discuss Feynman diagrams. And before that, I have to describe relativity. So I'll come back to this and fill in those pieces a little later. But before turning to relativity, I'd like to describe how the reverse wave theory explains two other important experiments and some other aspects of quantum mechanics. So first, consider the uncertainty principle. This can perhaps best be treated through an experiment uh, of Cl Professors Clauser, I'm sorry, Kaiser, Clothier, and Werner. The experiment employs a, a standard Werner type um, three crystal neutron interferometer, three crystals with a bismuth sample placed in one arm to retard the particles that pass there, to slow them down as they go by. Particles enter from the left, and they're detected over at the right. Now, the, the interferometer will accommodate a certain bandwidth of frequencies. You can put a crystal analyzer in one of the exit beams to narrow that bandwidth down to a smaller width of frequencies. So in the experiment, initially, the analyzer is absent. You just have the, the bismuth added to the interferometer. And with no bismuth, all the particles that exit are observed to come out in one direction, assuming you have this thing perfectly aligned. As one adds some bismuth, uh, the exit beam switches back and forth between the two sides. And eventually, if you put enough bismuth in here, the switching disappears and the particles go randomly in both directions. You don't see the interference anymore. Current quantum mechanics explains this by saying that each particle is a wave packet consisting of a coherent combination of all the frequencies that the interferometer will accommodate. The packet has a finite length delta x finite length delta x, given by Heisenberg's uncertainty relationship, which says that the uncertainty in position 
that is the, the length of the wave packet, times the uncertainty in momentum is given equals Planck's constant. The momentum P is related to the wavelength lambda in the usual, the usual quantum mechanical way. So a width of frequencies means a width of momentum. The wave packet, when it goes through the interferometer, it splits into two packets. And if the packet in the upper arm is slowed down a little bit, it shifts the phase and as a result, the interference changes at the third crystal, which is why the packet will switch and go the other way, because you'll get constructive interference that way, and you add a little more bismuth, and it'll go back in the other direction as you shift the phase by more and more. However, if you put in enough bismuth, the two packets in the two arms will no longer overlap when they get to the third crystal. And so the interference then disappears, and, and the neutrons will go randomly in both directions. However, if with the full business sample still in place, you insert this analyzer crystal, lo and behold, the interference reappears. As you add still more bismuth, the signal in this detector behind the analyzer will, will start to switch on and off again as if the beam was now going the other way instead of this way. Quantum mechanics explains this by saying that the narrowing of the width of the frequencies by the analyzer crystal expands the length delta x of the packet, still according to the same relationship. So now the two packets overlap again and the interference comes back. So according to quantum mechanics, narrowing the frequency width after the packets have already left the interferometer or already already gone the, 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 the wave packets have already gone through the interferometer will somehow backwards in time expand the length of those packets when they pass through the interferometer well according to the reverse wave theory the waves of relevance to the motion of the particle neutrons are coming from the detectors they travel backwards through the interferometer and, and, and they then interfere at the first crystal. And still, again, waves of all the frequencies that the interferometer will accommodate will be coming from the detectors and going through in the reverse direction. But these waves of different frequencies are all going to be entirely independent. They don't add up to a wave packet. With the bismuth absent and no analyzer crystal, all of those different ways will go, all the ways from one detector will go one way at the source and from the other detector they'll go the other way. So the only waves arriving at the source are going to be the ones from one detector, so all the particles will go to the one detector. The interference here is exactly the same as in the forward direction if you, you know, for each individual frequency.